new proclamations. What wise men, great men, medical men, professional people have not been able to do, God will do it. All those things that are forgotten, your forgotten strength, your forgotten power, your forgotten revelation, everything you said, I had a dream long ago. And I thought, this is what I will do. I've forgotten now, your forgotten vision will come up again. Passion will come up again. Revelation will come up again. New life will come up again in your life in Jesus' name. Only Christ Jesus has the power of this new year. An unforgettable encounter beckons. We are connecting to the God of wonders this new year for salvation and deliverance. Welcome GCK to Asaba. Delta State, Nigeria, January 26th to 31st, 2023. 1600 hours GMT daily and Global Sunday Worship at or 700 hours GMT. Also featuring ministers and professionals conference with Impact Academy for Youth, Young Adults and Young Professionals. It's a new year of wonders this 2023. From the Niger Delta, the oil of anointing will be transported by satellite and all our social media links to over 150 countries of the world. Join the team in GCK audience as the man appointed by God, the convener of GCK, Pastor Dr. W.F. Komoi, connects the world to an unforgettable encounter with the God of Wonders. Glorious music ministrations by choirs from nations across the world with guest music ministration by Jonathan Lee. Darkness gone. Yeah. Premature death cancelled. Yeah. Yours is now to reap the benefit. GCK, the, the gospel, gospel to every creature. Let us pray. Almighty God in heaven, how wonderful it is to appear in your presence again just to hear from you. We thank you because you give us the privilege of coming to learn from this divine revelation. Because the word that you have given us is our very life. It is what gives us a strong support in the storms of life. It is what gives us the hope of living with you eternally because we know the conditions you have set in the world. And we thank you because it is a thing that brings light in our pathway, in the dark or in the darkness of the world. Lord, we're looking up to you that today your watch will search our heart, discover our hearts, and bring us back so that we can live a life that is pleasing to you even from now on, in Jesus' name, open our understanding. Help us to see exactly what you have reserved for us in your word, that we may live a life to the full, according to the provision of Calvary through Christ. Be with us, O Lord, enlighten us today. Lead us in the right direction and grant us the heart, the desire to follow through and follow you to the end. In Jesus' name, we pray. Today we are resuming our studies of the epistle to the Colossians. If you have been following through since last year, you will see that we have covered a lot of ground in chapters 1 and 2. As we resume our studies on Colossians today, we are looking at Chapter 3 of Colossians, verses 1 through to 4. And we're looking at the risen life. The risen life. In the Bible, we have the life of man portrayed. We also have the life of the Christian portrayed. The life of the Christian is pictured or portrayed in various ways. There are ways in which the New Testament speaks about the life of the believer. And every aspect of the life of the believer is taken up in one portrayal or in one picture or the other. Today, we're looking at the Christian life as a life that is risen with Christ. 
A life that is seated in heavenly places with Christ. A life that is so identified with the resurrected life, the risen life of Christ. A life that thinks on the things above, seeks the things above, and is hidden with Christ in God. A life that is concentrated or preoccupied with the coming of the Lord and preparation for the coming of the Lord. Let's look at these four verses. Colossians chapter 3 from verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Here we are told about the life of the one who has risen with Christ. The life of the one who has got a change. A change that is equivalent to a resurrection kind of life. It says, if ye then be risen with Christ, the word if, the Greek authorities tell us could have been translated since. That is, it is a matter of fact that the believer has become identified with Christ in death, in burial, and now in resurrection. And literally it is saying, since ye then have been risen with Christ, on the basis of that fact of a resurrection with Christ, seek the things which are above, where Christ seated on the right hand of God. It is saying here, instead of thinking that you are earthly and therefore worldly, and you are standing on the earth or sitting on the earth, and then having all your thoughts, all your plans, all your life concentrated on the things on earth, where men dwell, where the things of the world are, where the system of the world or the civilization of the world is a major preoccupation of many minds. Instead of you, heart and feet and hands and body and plan, all earthly and worldly, it says, have a change. And seek the things that are above where Christ is seated on the right hand of God. You know that man was made from the dust of the earth. Man's original life came from the breath, the life, and the spirit of God. But then man fell. When sin came in, since the time of the fall, man's natural tendency is to go back to the dust of the earth. Man's natural tendency is to seek earthly things, mundane things. There is always a strong pull downward for man. And man seeks not God, not heavenly things, but the depraved man, the unregenerate man, the carnal man, the earthly, worldly man will seek the things of the world. His thoughts are not the thoughts of the things of God. In Psalm 10, verse 4, the wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. That shows the thought or the life of the carnal man, of the wicked man, of the unregenerate man, of the unsaved man is not centering his thoughts on things above, but on things below. In Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verse 21. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ's. Again, these are people that would even say they had some understanding of the gospel. But then the depravity of the human heart still takes the better part of their lives. 
And Paul the Apostle said of them, they were seeking their own. They were not seeking things above. They were not seeking for the glory of God. They were not seeking for the pleasure and the will of God, but the things that belonged unto them. They were just like the natural men in the world, natural men who have never been born again. Matthew chapter 6, verse 32. For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. So then we understand that there are people in this world that will not seek after God, but will seek after us listening. Their desires are not the desires after the things above, things of God, things in heaven. There might even be people that have come into the church. Maybe they say they are born again. But then they are not living according to the privilege of the new life, the risen life, the resurrected life. What do they seek? They still seek things on earth. Let me show you an example. In Numbers chapter 16, verse 10. And he has brought thee near to him, and all thy brethren, the sons of Levi with thee, and seek ye the priesthood also. You see, these people, they had been taken away from Egypt. And they would say that they had been redeemed. They would say that they were an inheritance of the Lord. They belonged unto the Lord. But then the selfish thing that the depravity of the heart brings out was still there. And Moses told them, are you seeking the priesthood also? There are many people that could be in the church. And instead of seeking for the glory of God, they still seek after the priesthood. They would say, I want to be this. I want to be that, and they will do everything to be what they want to be, apart from the will of God and the mind of God. Let me ask you the question that was asked in Genesis chapter 37. Let's look at it. Genesis chapter 37, verse 15. And a certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, what seekest thou? We can ask everyone this kind of question. What seekest thou? Here we are in the world. And many people are just wandering about in the field of the world. Jesus parables, the field is the world. And many people are just wandering about, roaming about. They're looking for things. Many things they're looking for. Some are looking for pleasure. Some are seeking for fame. Some are seeking for money. Some seeking for fashion. Some are preoccupied with the worldly system. And we can easily ask everyone, saying, What seekest thou? If you have not been seeking aright, the Lord is calling you that you will seek as Christ sought. You will seek exactly what Christ was seeking for when he was here in the world. To see if we have met the Lord, our lives will change. Our hearts will change. Everything about us will change. Our ambitions and desires also will change. And you'll become identified with Christ, and you will seek what is sought for. John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Verse 30. I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just. Because, listen to this, I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. I seek not mine own will. If we have identified with Christ, we will not seek our own will. We will seek the will of the Father who has sent us. John chapter 8, verse 50. And I seek not mine own glory. There is one that seeketh and judges. Christ said, I seek not mine own glory. Identification with Christ makes us to seek not our own glory, but the glory of God alone. When we become seated in heavenly places, 
will be keeping our treasures in heaven as well. You see, true spirituality is measured by the desires and ambitions we have in the heart. Like Jesus, we should always seek or set our eyes on things above. We have read together Colossians chapter 3 from verses 1 to 4. Let's think about three major parts of the message. One, spiritual resurrection and holy ambition. They go together. You cannot have holy ambition except you have become reasoning with Christ. On the other hand, if you already have experienced spiritual, um, spiritual resurrection, you will have holy ambition. If you have God's spiritual resurrection, you will have holy ambition. You cannot have one without the other. You cannot say, I have risen with Christ, but I have unholy ambition, unholy desires. I want earthly gain. I want the things of this world. I do not want the glory of God, but I am risen with Christ. There is nothing like that. On the other hand, you cannot say, I have holy ambition, holy desires. I lean completely upon God, and I am seeking the things that belong to God and the glory of God alone, and yet have not been born again, and yet have not been risen with Christ. No, it cannot be. Where there is spiritual resurrection, there will be holy ambition. Number two, identification with Christ and security in Christ. Again, those two things go together. When you identify with Christ, you will have security in Christ. On the other hand, if you do not identify with Christ, then you cannot have security in Christ. Identification with him brings security in him. Number three, Christ's return and our translation. Again, those two things go together. When he appears, we shall appear with him in glory. The rapture cannot take place until he comes. When he comes, then the dead in Christ shall rise. And then we which are alive will be quickened and taken away with him. Christ's return. And then our translation. Let's look at these one by one. And you will need to pray. As we read, as we study along that you will not just hear it, but the Lord will write it upon the tables of your heart, and all that we hear will change your life, that the Spirit of the living God will quicken this word and breathe upon it, so that it will have a definite transforming power and action in your life and in your heart. Let's look at this spiritual resurrection and holy ambition. In Colossians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3, from verse 1, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ seated on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. It says, if you have been risen with Christ, Show it, reveal it, let us see the evidence thereof. And what will the evidence be? The evidence is that you are seeking those things which are above. And you are seeking those things which are above every time in your Christian life. There are people that are spiritual at the beginning of their Christian lives. When they are new converts, they seek after the Bible, they seek after the things of God. They seek after the glory of God, but then, as the days come and go, as they become older in the church, as they become older in the kingdom of God, they get involved with the things of the world again. It appears that slowly and gradually, the depravity that had been dealt with comes back gradually, slowly, that they do not know. And before long, they are no more seeking the things which are above, where Christ is seated on the right hand of God. They are gradually seeking the things on earth. It may be at the time of politics, 
they are seeking other position in the political system of the world. It may be because of the economy, they are preoccupied with having more money, more of the things of this world, and every waking thought will be upon the things of this world. But the Lord is calling us back. He's saying, since you have been risen with Christ, and if in truth you are risen with Christ, seek those things, not things below, things above, where Christ seated on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above. Set your thoughts on things above. Your desires on things above, not on the things on the earth. Why? Because the things of this world are temporary. They are passing away. But the things above are the things that are permanent. Let us see to start with that every believer, every true believer, has been crucified with Christ and we have died with him. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Here Paul the Apostle said, I am crucified with Christ. He could have said, I was crucified. That will be true. But then he said, I am still in the present experience of my crucifixion with Christ. He said, nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, Christ liveth in me. That word is pregnant with meaning, very deep with meaning. Yet not I, Christ liveth in me. And we can say this, listen. Anyone that Christ is living in will not be preoccupied with the things of this world. He will not be entangled with the affairs of this world. He will not love the world. Neither will he love the things that are in the world. He will not set his affections on things below. He will set his affections on things above. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. That means if a person has been crucified to the world, and the world crucified unto him, his affections, his desires, his ambition will not be on the things of this world. His preoccupation, his dream, his thoughts, his waking thoughts and sleeping thoughts will not be upon the things in this world. His heart, his thoughts, his ambition and desires will be set on things above. In Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 from verse 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. All these passages of scripture show very clearly that at the moment we came to the Lord, we were crucified with Christ. We died with Christ. Not only that, at that same moment of salvation, the oppression of the grace of God and the face of Christ worked within us and we became risen with Christ. And now that we're risen with Christ, we're seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 2. 
reading from verse 1. Ephesians chapter 2, from verse 1. And you, as he quickened, made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. What is the result of that? That quickening, that resurrection, verse 5. Even when we were dead in sins, he has quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and has raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He has raised us up together. We have had spiritual resurrection. As a result of that, we are made to sit together in heavenly places with Christ and in Christ Jesus. That means then, from that time, our thoughts will be centered on things above. Because we now desire the things above, we can now say that we're seeking the things that belong to God, that belong to the glory of God. And we keep our treasures in heaven. Matthew chapter 6, from verse 19. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If Christ is your most precious treasure, then he's living in heaven, where Christ is seated on the right hand of God. If that, if Christ is your treasure, the most precious treasure, then your heart will be in heaven. You'll be seeking the things above, and you will set your affections on Christ, on heaven, on the hope of glory, on the very fact that all you have is really reserved in heaven for you. Look at Psalm 73. Psalm 73, from verse 25. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. This man, the psalmist said, In heaven all I have is you, and his heart is in heaven. The things of this world he will hold with a loose hand, because he knows that they are passing things. They will not continue forever. Whom have I in heaven but thee? It's not even thinking of the angels in heaven. It says, God is the center of my thought. It says, God is the one that is so precious unto me. And then it says, there is none upon the earth that I desire beside thee. There are many people that their thoughts are all scattered around. They place their confidence or trust in the uncle or cousin or relative. And then they put all their thoughts, all their affection on property, motor vehicle, money, job, work, wife, husband, various things and various people on earth. But this man said, there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. You see, if we're thinking of the things of this world, backsliding could come. Because even this man that I've read to you about now, he, he was almost backsliding. Look at it from verse 1 of Psalm 73. Truly God is good to Israel. Even to such as have a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death. But their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued as other men. 
Therefore, pride compasseth them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. Now, the psalmist there was thinking about the people of the world. For a moment, he was looking at the rich people of the world, prospered people of the world, and he saw that they were wicked. When he thought about it, he didn't know what conclusions to make. Verse 16, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. Surely, thou didst set them in simply places. Thou casted them down into destruction. They are brought into desolation. In, as in a moment, they are utterly consumed with terror. It was then that day Samus woke up and he said in verse 25, whom have I in heaven but thee? He said, the things of this world are not going to last. They are temporary or they are temporal. And they are going to pass away. And therefore now he brought his thought, his ambition, his, his everything into the things of heaven. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon the earth that I desire beside thee. When you recognize that you have been risen with Christ, you will be setting your affections on things above. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. While we look not on things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, and the things which are not seen are eternal. If you are a believer and you are setting your affections on things which are seen. Houses, money, property, gadgets in the house, property this way and that way, great job, good job, and uh, the things that people of the world can acquire and amass. Fame, popularity, a great name in the world, and even some streets being named after you and your name coming out in this area and this area, if that is what you are looking at, everything will soon pass away. After all, 70 years in the sight of the Lord is a very short time. But the apostle said, we look not at the things which are seen. On the other hand, even our afflictions, even our troubles, even our poverty, even our hunger, even our faint-heartedness, let us not look at all these persecutions and all these problems. We look not at the things which are seen. If a person wins for 10 years, 30 years, even 70 years, it's a very short time. All these things will pass away, the good things and the bad things, the tears and the joys. Everything will pass away. Let us keep on looking at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. Your tears which are seen, they are temporal. And your joys and happiness, on the other hand, which are seen, they are temporal. Your poverty, which people can see and they be pitying you, they are temporal. Your prosperity also, on the other hand, which are seen, are temporal. Your lack of popularity and fame. People saying they don't even know your name. All that is temporal. On the other hand, popularity and fame and authority in the world, all these things are temporal. The things which are not seen, they are eternal. Therefore, that's why we should realize our citizenship is in heaven. Our desires now should be different from the desires of the old life. Having eternal life and living in the presence of God will keep our affections heavenward. And we'll seek God. We will seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We will seek the heavenly country. We will seek things above. We will seek the welfare of God's people. We will seek God's presence. In fact, the pattern of our life is to be preoccupied with Christ and heaven. Look at it again. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. If ye then be risen with Christ, if ye have tasted of the resurrection power of Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ seated on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above. Let me just bring in this. If you are always watching television, 
I, I don't know you will set your affections on things above. You know why? You'll be seeing things of the world every time. When you close your eyes, you'll still be seeing things of the world. And you see, our interaction with the world has a lot of effect upon us. We are walking amidst the people of the world, in the markets with the people of the world, an interaction on the bus everywhere with the people of the world. And when you retire from the world and you sit before the television box, again, you bring the whole world before you. In the morning, in the afternoon, the place of work, now in the evening and in the night, you are still setting the world before you. You are looking at all their pleasures. You are looking at all the frivolity, all the evil things they are doing. And you are looking at all the things that will distract the attention of a real child of God. Are you going to set your heart, your affection on things above? If you are always listening to everything they are saying, a party there, a party here, and the things of the world, and the dressing of the world, it is not going to help you as a believer. Set your affection on things above. And if you are always, always, in the party, always interacting with the people of the world, always seeing them when they are dancing, always seeing them when they are drinking, always seeing them when they are uh, having this ceremony and that memorial service for this and for that. How are you going to set your affection on things above? Set your affection on things above and not on things on the earth. Let's go to point two. Identification with Christ and security in Christ. It says in verse 3, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Ye are dead. The New Testament has so much to say about our identification with the death of Jesus Christ. And it is a beautiful thing, a wonderful thing. But many people do not think about it. Many Christians do not think about what death does. When you have died with Christ, before I comment on what death actually does spiritually in our lives as believers, let me show you references of the Bible, just a few because there are so many of them. References of the Bible that show that we are dead with Christ. Notice the word dead with Christ. Let us look at Romans chapter 6 verse 11. Romans chapter 6. Let me read from verse 7. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Verse 8. Now, if ye be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Verse 11. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. The first point I need to make you understand is that when you are dead or when a person is dead, dead in the natural, dead in the physical, death brings a change of state. The state of the living person is different from the state of the dead person. A change of status. When somebody has died, the status will change, any way you think about it. A change of standing. Where did that person has been in society, his place will be vacant. A change of authority. Where he had authority before, death will bring a change. Now, think about this spiritually. We have died with Christ. And we ought to always be reckoning ourselves dead with Christ dead unto sin, that death brings a change of state. You are no more in the state of the unregenerate because you have died. You have died with Christ. A change of status. In the kingdom of God, you now have a different status, a higher status, because you have passed on to a new kingdom. A change of standing, a change of authority. You know, Enemies don't have authority and power over a dead person anymore. What can you do to a dead person? You can hate him. You may still be retaining enmity against him. You may even abuse him. You can even brag and threaten. What can your threat do against a dead man? 
the same thing. Death translates us into another society. You know, when a person has died, he goes into another society. It's no more here. Even though you may be seeing his dead body here, yet it's now in another society. Do you know, when we die with Christ, we're no more here, really. We're no more here, really. Our thoughts, our desires, our ambitions, and even the people of the world or, the, or Satan, they don't have any kind of authority over us anymore because death translates us into another kingdom, another dominion, another realm. Death frees us from the power and the plan of man and from the power and plan of Satan. And death brings us under God's decision and sentence. It is only what God says now that will take effect in our lives because we have died with Christ. Dying with Christ identifies us with Christ in the sight of God. We are dead to sin and we now live in righteousness by the power of the risen Christ. Let's look at Galatians chapter 6 again, verse 14. Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. You see, when you have died, the world does not have the attraction that he had, it had before, does not have it again upon your life. Because you are crucified to the world, and the world is crucified unto you. Second Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. Sorry, verse 11. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. That means now that since we are dead with Christ, dead with Christ, now we live with Christ as well. I told you earlier that identification with Christ also goes along with Security in Christ. Security in Christ. Our life is now hid with Christ in God. Colossians chapter 3, verse 3. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Ye are dead. As a result of that, your life is hid with Christ in God. Think about it in the natural. When a person dies, you go to hide his dead body in the grave, away from the sight of man, away from the sight of the whole world. The same thing what the Bible is saying here is that once you are dead spiritually, that is, you are dead with Christ. You identify with the death of Christ. Now your life is hid with Christ in God. Hidden away from Satan hidden away from all human enemies, hidden away from demons, hidden away from the world. And the eternal life God has given you is secured because you are secured in Christ. When we talk about being hidden with the Lord, let's look at Psalm 91, verses 1 and 2. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. His life is hid with Christ in God. He is in the refuge. He is in the fortress. His life is hid with Christ in God. And He will say, God is my God, my refuge, my trust. And therefore, no harm will come upon his spiritual life or even his physical life. He's hidden. He has security in Christ. Psalm 17, verse 8. Keep me as the apple of the eye. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings. Remember, when you are dead with Christ, your life is hid with Christ in God. 
Psalm 31, verse 20. Thou shalt hide them in the secret of thy presence from the pride of man. Thou shalt keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. Remember, you are dead with Christ and your life is hid with Christ in God. Let me show you an illustration in J Jeremiah chapter 36. Jeremiah chapter 36, verse 26. But the king commanded Jeremiah, the son of Amalek, Am and Zeriah, the son of Azuriel, and Shelemiah, the son of Abdiel, to take Baruch, the scribe, and Jeremiah, the prophet. But the Lord heed them. But the Lord heed them. You see, Jeremiah was a servant of the Lord. And the king and all these people were after him. And he commanded that they should go and take him so that they will hurt him and persecute him. And they were also looking for Barak, his secretary. But then it says, the Lord heed him. And the Lord still does that today. When you recognize that you have died with Christ and you are living the risen life, then he hides your life with Christ in God. And he gives you security. And the devil cannot pull you out of his hand. You are dead with Christ. You are dead to sin. You live in righteousness. By the power of the risen Christ. After Christ's death and resurrection, he was received to the right hand of God, hidden away from the enmity and cruelty of men, demons, and Satan. The same thing with you. You are dead with Christ, therefore your life is hid or hidden with Christ in God. Therefore, you have peace, you have rest, you have security in Christ. Point three. Christ's return and our translation. Christ's return and our translation. Colossians chapter 3, verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. On the one hand, it talks about the appearance of Christ. That means the second coming of Christ, when Christ will appear. And it talks about also our translation, our appearing also with him in glory. The Bible talks about the second coming of Christ in so many passages. Christ himself spoke of his second coming with clarity and certainty. The angels spoke about it as a fact already settled in heaven. The apostles always proclaimed, Christ's second coming with unshakable assurance of those who knew that God cannot lie. Of the truth, Christ shall appear. In 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6 from verse 14, that thou keep this commandment without spot or unrebukable until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord is coming back. Titus chapter 2, verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The Lord definitely is coming back. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him, shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. That means as he's coming back, he will not be coming back to make an offering for sin again. He'll be coming back without the sin offering. He'll be coming back just to take the saints away. He has once made an offering for sin. And that sacrifice for sin is enough. He will not do it again at his appearing. Therefore it says unto them that look for him. Shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation? 
those people that have been cleansed and are waiting for the coming of the Lord and are living a righteous life, he will come and receive them unto himself. First Peter chapter 5, verse 4. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. You'll see the word of God talks about the second coming of the Lord, the appearing of the Lord with great certainty. And it says, when he comes, our prayer, our desire, our endeavor should be that we will not be ashamed at his sight. We'll be fully prepared, adequately prepared. First John chapter 2, verse 28. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. The Lord is coming back. All those who are backsliding and they have not been restored, they will be ashamed when Christ will come. He will take those who are standing, those who are pure, those who are righteous, those who are living holy lives. He will take them away. He will leave the compromising, the sinful, the backsliding. He will leave them behind and they will be ashamed when Christ will come. But you abide in Christ. Abide in Christ. Remain with him. Keep on living the holy, the righteous life. So that when he shall appear, we will have confidence with him. And we shall not be ashamed when he comes. Chapter 3 from verse 1. First John chapter 3 from verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. That we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, how now are we the sons of God? And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, you see that when he comes back, when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure you have the hope with you or in you then purify yourself even as christ is pure the lord is coming again and the future of the real child of god is as bright as the glory of god when he appears we will be manifest with him in glory the veil that now shrouds our high life from others will be withdrawn the world that persecutes us now, despises us now, ignores us now, will then be blinded by or with the dazzling glory of our revelation. If you have the hope of going to be with the Lord, then you must keep yourself pure. Jude from verse 24. Jude from verse 24. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God our Savior, the glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Already the Lord has shown us the higher life, the reasoning life of the true believer. If you have been born again, then set your affections on things above. Realize you have died with Christ. Realize you are dead to sin. Realize you are hid with Christ in God. And be getting ready for the coming of the Lord. Let nothing get you ashamed when the Lord will come. Rise up. Talk to the Lord in prayer. Are you born again? Keep in your experience with the Lord. Are you sanctified? Keep that holiness, because without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. If you have the hope that you want to see his face at his appearing, then you keep yourself pure, even as the Lord is pure. And all the time, keep on setting your affections on things above. Let not the things of the world drag you down or make you to backslide. Remain in the Lord, remain with the Lord. Live the life that God will be pleased with so that you will not be ashamed at the appearing of Christ. Pray until you know in your heart that everything is settled between you and God and should Christ come any time, there will be nothing to make you ashamed.